Hey there, welcome to episode 109 of the Social Business Engine Podcast, a podcast where I invite thought leaders from all industries to share their real world expertise on social and digital communications best practices. I'm Bernie Borges from Find and Convert and your host of the Social Business Engine Podcast. On today's episode, you are going to meet Brian Solis, best selling author and principal analyst at the Altimeter Group, a profit company. On this episode, you are going to gain insight into Altimeter's Opposite Framework, which is an acronym that represents a compilation of eight best practices guiding today's successful organizations through their digital transformation. Now, this episode is sponsored by our very own social business workshop for business development. This online workshop is delivered in both group and one-on-one coaching sessions. It's designed for business development teams who want to learn how to use social media channels to build key relationships that create sustained sales results. To learn more about this online workshop, just visit socialbusinessengine.com slash workshops. And now, here's my interview with Brian Solis, best-selling author and principal analyst at the Altimeter Group, a profit company. Hey, Brian, welcome to the Social Business Engine podcast. Hey, Bernie, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you. Thank you for jumping on here after your returns from a recent overseas trip. And I know as we were chatting just before we started recording, you've got more travel coming up. It seems to be the the life of Brian Solis, uh, just globe trotting uh, to keynote after <laughs> keynote and consulting uh, among uh, the, the leading brands of the world. So as I mentioned off the air, I live vicariously online by following <laughs> your adventures. <laughs> I love that. The, the life of Brian brings up other connotations, of course, and uh, it all makes me smile. And you know, and and, and thank you. It's it's a very as, as we were talking about earlier. It's a very uh, it's a very fortunate place to be in. That uh, that finally after. I don't know, maybe 20 years of, of studying technology and its impact on business and society, that there are people now willing to listen. So I will take it for all it's worth until uh, people get tired of me talking. Well, I have been in the audience as a listener, so you've got a lot of good stuff to say, and uh, you've written a few books along the way, but we're going to get to that, so we're jumping ahead a little bit. Where I'd like to begin is not every one of my listeners might be familiar with your company, Altimeter Group, and you mentioned, I mentioned in the intro that it's a profit company. So if you would, Brian, why don't you give a brief explanation of Altimeter Group? Yeah, Altimeter Group is uh, about six years old. Uh, we're a, a small, uh, by small I mean focused uh, analyst firm that studies specifically uh, disruptive technology. Uh, and we also study its impact on business. And we publish reports uh, around various aspects of disruptive technology and also what businesses are doing to sort of change or transform or get ahead of it or what they're not doing uh, as a way of helping to lead executives down the right paths, uh, help them sort of pave the way for the future of, of business, if you will. Okay. And you know, on top of that, you know, as, as analysts, we uh, we we advise uh, executives, uh, at, like you said earlier, some of the biggest brands around the world. Uh, and in July of last year, uh, we were acquired by a brand strategy consultancy called Profit, of which uh, uses our research as ways to sort of have direct access for expertise and 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 know how uh, for their the bigger roster of brand clients to, to help them through things like customer experience design or, or digital transfer transformation or social business evolution. Cool. All right. Terrific. Well, you mentioned uh, published reports. Um, I have to really give a shout out for just the fact that Altimeter Group publishes those reports on your website. And the only transaction is a little information, name, email, company, that kind of thing. But these, these are reports that in many other scenarios, people would pay for. They're that rich in insights. Oh yeah. Well, well, first you're welcome. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, uh, it's been a, it's a very hard balance. I mean, these are reports. For example, I have a report coming out in the next week uh, that documents the six stages of digital transformation that I've been working on for about a year and a half. And it is uh, bittersweet to get these babies published, uh, and then you know, give them, give them away for. Uh, <laughs> 
so, but but yes, I mean, there are there are firms that publish reports and are able to charge thousands of dollars for them. Uh, and it's because of the hard work and the insights that go into them. But we have a, a different model. It's an open source research model of which we give the re- reports out for free as a way of sort of doing the marketing uh, for for our work and our thought leadership and hopefully earning opportunities to advise businesses or or speak around the world about uh, about our research. Well, apparently it's working because uh, Altimeter Group is a very well-recognized brand in your space. Uh, I think you know that I've had three of your colleagues on the Social Business Engine podcast previously. I've had Jessica Groupman, Ed Turpening, and then, of course, your leader, Charlene Lee, uh, Charlene being the most recent. So uh, I've been a longtime admirer and consumer of the research reports. So let, let's, let's dive in because um, where I want to go is we're going to be talking about one of the most recent reports that you published. But first, I want to gain a little insight into something. In my introduction of you, Brian, I mentioned that you're a best-selling author and, and you've written what? Seven books, including the most recent one. Is that right? That is right on. Okay. All right. Now, uh, here's what I want to know. Here's what inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> which, which comes first? Do your books inspire your research or does your research inspire your books? Wow. Okay. All right. Well, so <laughs> I, I think there's a bit of, of, of both. I, I'll, I'll just, I'll answer it as absolutely transparent and honest as I can. So and then well, let's see what the answer is because I, I don't actually know the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I there's a there's a part of me that we haven't introduced yet, which is also I'm a digital anthropologist, and most of that work is not done at Altimeter Group. In fact, none of it is. That's uh, that's where I, I'm a digital analyst, but it's my nights and and weekends really for the last ten fifteen years actually. Uh, I've really studied human behavior, uh, digital's impact on society, cultures, norms, values, uh, and sort of reverse engineered that. Uh, there's a real interesting aspect of it that when you when you research, say, topics like for I study digital transformation, innovation, disruption, uh, customer experience, uh, and there are aspects of which start to intertwine, right? So when you look at what businesses are doing in the face of these trends uh, or or disruptive events you you study and you observe what is right you get to see what some companies are doing well what companies aren't doing well but more so there's a lot of gaps right and analysts are very good at sort of filling in those gaps based on their experience i have noticed over the years, especially if you look at predictions or just general assessments of, of brand new trends, you start to see where that essentially what they're doing is making assumptions, educated educated guesses. Mm-hmm. But when you have a way to fill in the gaps based on hard science or or social science, if you will, more appropriately, like anthropology, sociology, ethnography, psychology, you really start to fill in those gaps in a much more informed way, in a much more empathetic way, I should say. And that is where I, I hope my thought leadership becomes a little bit different than than others uh, because it's actually informed by, by the work I do in, on social science uh, fronts. And th- that goes into the books. Uh, a lot of that goes into the books because it's a much more human and approachable way of uh, uh, embracing a reader that isn't necessarily hard research. But with that, though, I will I will also say that it is incredibly complex to bring those worlds together. Uh, and as we'll talk about later in the show, you know, this last book took three 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 and a half years from beginning to end because we are living in very complex times. There are a lot of complexities of associated with why certain companies or why certain executives don't just say, yes, I totally get it. What do I need to do? Uh, and then more so, I don't even know that consumers or, or, or human beings themselves actually understand the change of which they're undergoing. Uh, so there's a lot of really interesting aspects to this of which then uh, allow me to be a very um, diverse individual on, on, on very fixed aspects of, of certain subjects. Uh, so that's probably the biggest non-answer you ever got. <laughs> well, so here's, here's, the, here's the way my brain interprets that, Brian. So I asked you which inspires which, your books inspiring your research or your research inspiring your books, and I think you said yes. Yeah, it's probably. <laughs> I think that's exactly the answer. <laughs> 
I, I can't imagine how they're separate, though, based on just the life that you live as an analyst, as a digital anthropologist, as an advisor, as a speaker, because we both know that to speak, to get on a stage, you prepare for that. All those elements of your world just mesh up and probably just make their way out into these books that you crank out that are phenomenal. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, the Yeah, I mean, the truth of the matter is that that's why I don't actually consult uh, as as a as an analyst and now as a, as an anthropologist uh, and and also as a, as a writer and I, I'd even throw something like philosopher in there because I don't know if you've noticed a lot of times in my social streams I'll post just thoughts and observations a lot of which I'll do on hotel stationery and you know share share those 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 thoughts with with folks as a way of creating sort of community around um, you know my explorations or mm-hmm. my and, or my discoveries or my uncertainties uh, and these are these are ways of just sort of fostering dialogue within the community so that means that I'm not the best consultant I'm not coming in and giving uh, advice on frameworks and leading workshops. Uh, I'm a much more um, HCD or human-centered design sort of style of, of, of engager, uh, if that even makes sense. Okay. Uh, so at the top of, of this episode, and every episode, I always introduce this podcast as the podcast that brings in thought leaders like yourself to talk about digital and social best practices. So where, where I'd like to go next in, in our conversation, Brian, is You've got a heavy focus on the digital customer experience, something that is known as DCX. And and if, by the way, if you coined that acronym, by all means, uh, own it. Um, But let's talk about that. Let's talk about DCX, the digital customer experience, and how it impacts your view of digital transformation in business. Well, certainly. I have not coined that. I, okay. I, I, I wish I did, but I, I certainly embrace it, and I'm a, and a staunch defender of it, and I'll tell you why, and then I'll explain why it, it, it affects digital transformation. The digital customer experience is incredibly profound because we tend to look at uh, markets in a very narrow, uh, in, in a very narrow view because it's easier to digest and it's easier to uh, put numbers around it that you can then apply budgets and metrics around, et cetera. The there is no such thing as a traditional customer anymore. In fact, I was having a, a conversation with a reporter who said, "Well, tell that to my mom." And I said, <laughs> "I said, well, I if if you want to, I I I I can't tell that to your mom because your mom is part of then uh, a breed of consumer that is becoming the the absolute minority." Uh, because my mother. Uh, we, are probably uh, your mother and my mother are probably the same age, and I can assure you that my mother is part of the of, of a digital lifestyle. Uh, so she doesn't act her age; she acts as part of uh, a similar set of behaviors, which are more commonly known as, as as psychographics versus demographics. And my point was is that when you look at people and how they they live a digital life, it's now then to a matter of extreme or a, a matter of level. To what extreme are you living a digital lifestyle? Are you on Snapchat or are you on Facebook? Because there's differences between the two. Uh, and what you start to see is that the digital lifestyle starts to portray a, a, a different consumer that is not just different in how they, they interact, but how they make decisions, uh, their expectations, their behaviors, their preferences, their values. So the digital customer experience is also the segment that's growing, whereas the traditional consumer segment is shrinking. In fact, there's a great article about uh, from Netflix today that, that said, if we, we cannot base the future shows that we create around demographic preferences anymore. In fact, we're learning everything by, uh, from psychographics in the shows that we create. So essentially what that is saying is that things like the digital customer experience give you insights to how consumers are evolving how the marketplace is evolving right it's very it's still very complex but it also allows you to humanize people when we really tend to look at them for hey put your phone down you know look up be part of uh, be part of the moment mm-hmm. uh, you know stop stop taking so many selfies uh, stop streaming music buy albums instead right and so we get we get a chance to actually see people uh, in ways that make sense so long story short is the digital customer experience actually allows you to learn uh, in ways that give way to a better customer experience in general it's no no 
a surprise that most people don't like calling contact centers. It's no surprise that most people don't like websites. It's no surprise that people don't like being sold uh, mm-hmm. by salespeople. Uh, so essentially what it does is it gives you data, uh, evidence, and, and uh, numbers of which to then make the case for better customer experiences in each moment and then holistically. Okay, fantastic. So great segue to... A discussion that I want to have with you around the document, the downloadable content asset that uh, really inspired me to reach out to you for this conversation. And that is uh, a document that you, uh, I think you led it and co-authored it with uh, with Jamie Zamansky, and it's titled eight, six, eight Success Factors, easy for me to say, Eight Success Factors of Digital Transformation. And in it, you go into great length to describe how businesses are taking the quote-unquote opposite approach to business as usual. So let's start with what is the opposite framework? Yeah, thanks for thanks for bringing this up. This is the this is the one report that I when I get more time I'm going to put more more publicity and oomph behind it because I think everybody needs to read this. It's not just it's not just about digital transformation. It's or, or the digital customer experience. What what it actually allows you you could take this framework actually and apply it to marketing, you could apply it to social business, you could apply it to customer service, you could apply it to every aspect of business or every or, or human resources, uh, even uh, it, it's it, it really just forces the opposite approach to what we tend to do, which is look at technology as a solution, uh, or or look at technology as a roadmap, as a series of of solutions. When in fact, when in the discussions we had around the digital customer experience, what we're really talking about is how do you how do you understand from an empathetic point of view. Uh, how someone's perspective in how they make decisions and go through life uh, is absolutely different than yours because you're making decisions based on your hunches, your experience, your your expectations, not the way that people are going through life, uh, whether in work or, or or at home. So the opposite approach was based on, uh, I think, the, the, the sum of about 34 interviews with some of the leading, leading brands uh, that are going through digital transformation today. Uh, some of the names that you know, was, as well as a lot of the executives that we all admire. And this was a series of best practices that I documented. This wasn't even supposed to be its own report until I... I stumbled upon it in in working with Jamie over the years. We said, "Wow, we're we're just sitting on a little bit of a gold mine here. This these are the eight things that companies are really doing well, and we're not dumbing it down to some three letter or four letter acronym. It's a complex series of of, of aspects because what you're really doing is shifting perspective and then putting action behind that shift in perspective. So the opposite is this. It's just an acronym that stands for orientation, people, processes, objective, structure." insights, technology, and execution. If you look up the opposite framework on Google with my name, you can download it for free. Uh, and it really walks you through how sh- how going through this and how to go through this uh, will allow you not only to shift perspective, but to start to put your business into the process of digital transformation, which is allowing you to essentially create new value, create new opportunities in a digital economy by living life the way your customers and your employees are learning how to go through life. Okay. Now, Brian, years ago, I learned of a concept that I intuitively knew, but I didn't know the word. And the con- the concept was an unconscious competent. And so an unconscious competent is one who is competent at something, but they couldn't tell you why or how. A conscious competent can tell you exactly how and why they're competent. So the reason I bring that up is what I'd like to know is the brands that you interviewed, are they consciously competent in this opposite framework or did you and Jamie sort of arrive at that after you had these interviews? We we arrived at that uh, after the interviews. We noticed a series of patterns taking place, of which we sat on because this was all. These are this is a derivative of several other reports, uh, which is, by the way, if you can remind me of this in terms of change agents, I'll uh, I'll tell you about another observation that's leading to a report in all of these conversations as well, that uh, a really help help people inside of the organization recognize what they're doing as a way of teaching other people then what to do. How do you 
break this down into a series of steps that become uh, followable and actionable. So, in fact, if you talk to anybody uh, in in these series of interviews, they'll tell you that they haven't done enough yet, that there's still more to do, that they're still they're still frustrated. They don't feel like they've come far enough, fast enough, uh, which is fascinating when you when you look at where they were and where they are today. Right, everything I guess hindsight is is twenty twenty, especially if it's from the outside in. But yes, this was all observations based on the great things we had noticed that other people might take for granted because they're still trying to uh, move mountains. Mm-hmm. And and you actually, you correlated this to the, the word opposite, right? I mean, you actually, you, know, you and Jamie sort of observed all this and you realized that there's really an opposite approach that they're taking and then you were able to actually derive the the elements that also made up that acronym. Is that right? That's exactly right. It was definitely an aha moment because sure. we were talking about how a lot of this was the opposite approach. Simply starting, if nothing else, with people uh, or uh, pain or some other element besides the technology as a solution, which is what we see so many businesses do uh, in in their digital transformation processes. Uh, and then the elements of which form opposite just sort of fell into place. I, I don't want to say it was just sort of like, oh. <laughs> but it oh you did that really well <laughs> it, it all lined up pretty pretty uh it, it's just it just works okay. uh, and and it and it also is right okay. i'll tell you a little secret though if you don't mind uh bernie was just that between you and me yeah just between you me and and the few people listening here is uh that a lot of people in this industry do not like acronyms of this length and this specificity mm-hmm. uh uh, and it's because a lot what 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 we want to do is or technically what we're supposed to do is give people threes, right. maybe fours uh, as a simple way of helping them sort of read and share the content. But you know i I, I just refuse to dumb anything down sure. or, or oversimplify it. something as complex as changing your ex- your entire business and how yeah. it thinks and works. Yeah. Uh, so the opposite approach is is what I believe a real workable model that anybody could take and and use cool so can you speak to because i want to get to um your new book x but before we get to that uh, i want to do one more um little bit of a dive on on this whole opposite framework and that is can you speak to any brands and you don't have to name names who are succeeding with this opposite framework What, what are they doing that is just so effective all right well i i I would be lying if I said businesses are using this opposite framework uh, to do what they're doing. But what the opposite framework represents is exactly what businesses are doing. They just didn't know it Mm. uh, or they didn't have it sort of assembled in this unique way. But I will tell you companies like Sephora, Starbucks, General Motors, they're all taking this approach towards not just digital transformation, but business transformation, right? Mm-hmm. If you think you think about what what most businesses are sort of stuck in today is the idea that, you know, their businesses are built on, I don't know, uh, 50, 50 year old models that really haven't mm-hmm. changed much. Uh, if you look at the idea of the funnel, we all talk about the funnel being dead, but I I, I hate to break it to 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 thought leaders is that the funnel's very much alive and yeah. it's and it's reinforced by the very business models that it's just not linear anymore <laughs> exactly and and business models are still designed to be linear uh, in fact it's 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 still mind blowing that a lot of these departments who are responsible for different aspects of the customer journey do not actually work with one another uh, and this is why I always say that customers don't see sub- departments they see one brand and and they now are so empowered and so connected and so informed that they realize they have choices and this is why we're seeing so much disruption but the companies like the General Motors, Sephora, Starbucks, Lego that are really doing this the right way uh, are actually learning as they go they're able to apply the opposite approach to small things and then big things and then it gets a lot of momentum and if if it's one last thing that I could say is that all of the people leading change within those organizations have a laundry list of things that they still need to get done, but they're going to use the opposite approach every single time they do something new. Hmm. Okay, cool. All right, so let's talk about your latest book, X. You mentioned earlier, and I'm not sure that I remember the exact number, but I thought you said you worked on this book for a couple of years, give or take, so correct me if I'm wrong. 
And uh, and again, it was inspired by everything we've just been discussing. So tell us about X. Yeah, well, X is, uh, the, the full book is called X, The Experience When Business Meets Design. And all in, it's about three and a half years of work. Wow. Uh, and I started it actually before my last book, which was What's the Future of Business, a.k.a. WTF. And I read that book. Ah, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, WTF was a book I started after X uh, and for a lot of reasons, one of which was the subject of X was very difficult to simplify. Uh, they, uh, that's what's that old Einstein quote, that if, if you can't simplify it, you don't know the subject well enough. I'm just totally paraphrasing it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> the idea of experience, believe it or not, when I started the book was I was inspired by the fact that the word experience to me was very, very personal. Uh, it's very deep. Uh, it's something that I, I, I absolutely related to in, in life when I found myself being told to follow rules, follow processes. Uh, but the one thing I noticed was the way I experienced the world didn't line up with the processes that I was told to follow or the rules that I was told to abide by. Uh, so experience was very personal. I needed to see if why I could feel certain things uh, in my own way, yet I couldn't get those same reactions when I, w- when I worked with companies or when I uh, used certain products and why that had to be something different. So I decided to tackle experience design, which the word experience and experience design is ridiculous in that there weren't really common definitions of what the word experience meant or how to use it in work, marketing, business, or what have you. I thought I was going to be able to lean on some really great work to translate for the the book audience, but it just turned out that I was going to have to uh, make this make it up as well, not make it up, but essentially innovate as I was mm-hmm. going along, mm-hmm. which was in, very hard. So I, I had a great case of avoidance behavior syndrome, uh, <laughs> and decided to write WTF. Uh, with some of the ideas that I was coming up with as ri- as I was writing X with the idea of making a book and experience, which is why WTF was a different shape, which right. is why it looked a little bit more like uh, an app than it did a book, and uh, was really my way of saying, as an author, I need to disrupt myself as well. I can't just come at this and tell you that you have to start designing experiences, yet I'm going to tell you that in a traditional book, and I'm not going to challenge myself at all. Um, so I decided to think about, well, what could, a, what could a book be in 2016? What could that experience be like? Uh, does it have to be like a book or is that just legacy-based thinking? Could, could, I, could I do what Uber did to transportation and, and think about it as a blank slate and make it more meaningful to today's brain and today's expectations? So the, you had the balance of trying to come up with something that was experience and also the aspect of creating a design that was experiential, uh, familiar and intuitive, uh, bringing those together and trying to convince a publisher to uh, – <laughs> <laughs> basically let you change yeah. how they what a book is and how they make it uh, and then try to make it affordable so that people will still buy it. So I have to ask you this question because it's been so 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 much on my mind. In the book title, the ex- the book's title is X, the experience where business meets design. So the word design just feels different. You know, we we associate design with software with apps with things that are very visual in in our experience you know in our sensory so you want to talk about how why that's just baked into the title and the dna of the book yeah the dna of the book so i i use the word design because it was a it's a word that i think people can appreciate uh, and that experiences need to be designed but you'll notice in the book i actually use the word uh, architecture um, and architect uh, more than I use the word design to get a real explicit uh, to uh, draw explicit imagery about the fact that you are building something uh, and that building before you actually build the physical building of it you have to get through the blueprints and the, mm-hmm. the, you know, understand sort of the intentions and the outcomes and and the activities uh, of which you're you're building for uh, and I, I in the book I tell the story of uh, the movie The Matrix and seven and Tron and every one of those movies I think we all love them for for a lot of various different reasons but every one of those movies has a character called the architect and the architect's role in the movie is to design the world so that it feels 
uh, intuitive and home, uh, like home and very personal. Uh, and that was the idea of experience architecture that you don't necessarily have to design an experience, but you do have to build an experience so that it's relatable and relevant and wonderful uh, holistically and then also in each moment. Uh, and so that uh, the words that I, I, I use around that were very intentional to reach a broader array of people that they could, you know, maybe some are going to relate to design, some will relate to architecture, but what they all, will all come away with is the idea that uh, we don't have to leave experiences up to chance, which is what a lot of people do, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people are going to have an experience when they call you, when they hit your website, when they use your product, when they talk to a representative. Uh, and today, they are just operating against scripts or standards or style guides, but no one has ever said, this is the experience of which we want people to feel, what we want them to do, <laughs> and then more so how that comes together holistically and then also in the moment. So one last thing is that if you look at the word customer, the words customer experience, you know, which is one of the biggest trends right now in business uh, transformation. And you ask somebody, well, hey, what does the word customer experience mean to you? You'll get a, a million different answers, right? Mm -hmm. But what it, what it actually means is that customer experience is the sum of all engagements a customer has with you in each touch point and throughout the customer journey and life cycle. It's the sum of it all, not mm -hmm. just one aspect of it. So why wouldn't it be working against an experiential standard of which we should build and then measured in each moment and then also holistically? It would make you think about how you do business differently. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I can see, I was going to ask you another question, but I think, you know, uh, I've kind of answered it in my own head, but I'll share it with... Uh, <laughs> with you and listeners, right? And that is that it really spans all industries because all industries are dealing with customers and delivering experience of, an experience of some sort. So the strategy, the, the model applies. Oh, everywhere. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is something that a lot, I mean, diff, it's, it's sort of like psychographics and demographics. It's, it's, it's not sort of which industries are going to be hit. Every industry has a disruption event on its, on its horizon. It's just sort of how does the inside of the organization allow for itself to sort of balance between iteration, innovation, and disruption, right? And I think most businesses get caught up in iteration. This is something I found my, myself uh, in, too, as an author. Iteration is just doing the same things better. But innovation is doing new things that unlock new value and create new opportunities, whereas disruption is doing new things that make the old things obsolete. Uh, and if you look at the remote control for the television, I think that's a great, great sort of visual metaphor for what businesses do is they take new technology, they take new things, they take new trends, and they stack it on top of old foundations. And what mm. you end up with is this you know, brick that I don't think anybody loves. I think we all have reluctant relationships with our remote controls, but it's because no one's ever thought to say, well, what we, we've got this other group over here designing these really incredible 4K flat screen televisions, yet they're all going to ship with this brick. So why don't <laughs> why why aren't we talking to each other to deliver an experience that people actually want in that when they use their phones, they're pinching, swiping, zooming, right? Because of their favorite apps. Well, this is why I think that if you think about experience design, look at Uber, right? We don't have to talk about the taxi industry. Just talk about the fact that if you open an app, you can have a car come to you in four minutes mm -hmm. and you can track it. You can pay for it without ever paying for it. You can know more or mm -hmm. not, you know, not actually pulling out your credit card or cash. Uh, you can see the driver and the review. You can, there's, there's so much empowerment to the, the user that that's a new customer experience and, standard. And the driver can review you. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. How opposite is that? <laughs> a little, little pun intended. Sorry. I love that pun. Oh, hi, virtual high five. <laughs> cool. All right, Brian, well, just keeping an eye on our time here, what I am going to attempt to do now is to summarize, um, really summarize just the, the, the key points that we discussed here. And then I'm going to ask you to fill in any holes, elaborate on anything that uh, you want to elaborate on, and then we'll take it to a wrap. All right. All right. So we began our conversation with your introduction uh, of the Altimeter Group, a profit company, and how uh, you're an analyst firm the, studying disruptive technologies. You publish these terrific reports that are made available as open source and uh, your advisors, and you were uh, acquired by profit. I think I mentioned that. 
Um, you said that you yourself, Brian, are both a digital anthropologist and philosopher. And I, you know, I kind of knew that about you, kind of, by following you, but um, hearing you say it really kind of lit a light bulb for me because it connected, you know, a lot of dots for me. You talked about how you study human behavior and you're filling in the gaps of human behavior and digital behavior. I'm not sure if I captured that accurately, so feel free to uh, uh, elaborate or correct me on that. And then we, we talked a little bit about how, you know, you're an author, you've written uh, seven books and how you really look at the complexity of current business practices and business climates and also kind of lump that together with what how we are evolving, evolving as humans in our own behavior and how we act as consumers and sellers and so forth. And I'm paraphrasing here, but that's kind of what I, I got out of that. Then we talked about the digital customer experience, DCX. Um, you, you said that there's no such thing as a traditional customer anymore. I love that. I totally agree with that. Things like psychographics versus demographics. And the, the digital customer experience is growing because the traditional customer is shrinking. And that's because um, the digital the, the, the experience is evolving so fast. I mean, almost on a daily basis, the, the digital customer experience evolves. It can be different tomorrow as it was today. And then we, uh, we got to the report, uh, the eight success factors of digital transformation using the opposite framework, the acronym, how you interviewed uh, 34 leading brands and uh, you and Jamie um, really kind of wrapped it around this, uh, this opposite framework, which stands for orientation, people, process, objectives, structure, insight and intent, technology and execution. And how you talked about how long acronyms are not popular, but nonetheless, it was the right acronym. And how brands like Sephora and Starbucks and GM are, are really building their transformational strategies around this framework. And then we talked a little bit about your book, uh, your most recent book, X, The Experience Where Business Meets Design. You worked on it, I think you said three and a half years, uh, and how experience is something very personal to you. And how when you were uh, writing and publishing WTF, what, you know, the future, what's the future of business, that you wanted to create an experience and you actually wanted to disrupt your own authorship. I love that. That's, that's so awesome. And, and how the book is, is basically about how businesses need to architect the experience. They need to create an experiential standard and that the role is to create an experience that is relevant and wonderful to the customer. And don't leave it up to chance. Architect it. So that's kind of my wrap up. Uh, tell me if I have any holes there you want to fill in or clarify or correct anything I may have stated in my summary. Well, you know, first of all, that was an amazing summary. Wow. Uh, I am <laughs> I'm super impressed. The, 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 I don't even know what to say. The, 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 last, the last thing I would say is this, is that what I didn't get a chance to talk about uh, in, in terms of X and the book and why you should read it is, is this, is that it puts you at the center of the story and it, it allows you to become a human again instead of thinking like a traditional business executive uh, or strategist or the typical roles that we get caught up in. And I, I say somewhere in the book that, you know, hey, I tried to be innovative and creative once, but I got stuck in meetings all day. <laughs> you know, the, it, it, it's a real, it's a real wonderful journey that that brings you out of your norm, uh, brings you out of your everyday to help you see perspective. Uh, and I tell the story of David Foster Wallace's um, commencement speech about this is water and how you know, it, for fish it's very easy to forget that they're actually in water uh, unless you were to point it out and then marvel in it. And that's exactly what we kind of need to do. And it's mm -hmm. a very, uh, hopefully a very personal story that inspires you to be the change that we all need. Uh, even if it starts with one person, uh, it has to start somewhere. And and I hope, uh, I hope it helps you. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Well, my listeners know that everything we discuss here today that is online will be on our show notes page at our website. But where would you like to send people to learn more about you, Altimeter Group, and your books? Well, you could, you could uh, look at me over at briansolis.com. Uh, Altimeter Group is altimetergroup.com. Uh, I'm pretty much at Brian Solis on all mm -hmm. of your favorite your favorite apps. And then, you know, the book X uh, and all my books are available in a bookstore uh, near you or at Amazon or Barnes & Noble online or your favorite place. 
All right, terrific. Well, Brian, thank you so much for joining me here today on the Social Business Engine Podcast to talk about X and to talk about opposite and to talk about all these uh, really insightful things that you are doing and contributing to the re- really to, to the world, giving us I- insight. Uh, I'm just going to look for the day where you have your own show on some some network, you know, that's just all about this, <laughs> this, this whole topic of transformation. Cause that's kind of how I sum you up in my head. You are about transformation. Well, I, I'm about, um, yeah, I, I am. I, I want to, I want to build a world that feels the kind of place that we all wanted to live in rather than living by the rules of people who, uh, who look at the world through the lens of yesteryear. Terrific. Well, thank you again, Brian. Thank you, Bernie. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Brian Solis, best-selling author and principal analyst at the Altimeter Group, a profit company. Just want to remind you that this episode is sponsored by our very own Social Business Workshop for Business Development. You can learn more about this online workshop at our website at socialbusinessengine.com slash workshops. And also want to remind you, if you are not subscribed by email to get our weekly podcast updates that we send every Friday, just visit our subscribe page. And if you are so willing to consider writing a review in iTunes about this podcast so that others might discover it, just go to socialbusinessengine.com slash iTunes. And lastly, I invite you to engage with me on Twitter. I am at Bernie Borges. This podcast is is also on Twitter and on Instagram with the handle at SBEngine and follow our hashtag SBE show. Well, that's going to do it for episode 109. I want to thank my guest once again, Brian Solis, best-selling author and principal analyst at Altimeter Group, a profit company. This is Bernie Borges of Find and Convert, wishing you continued success on your social business journey.